Okay, so let's go ahead and get going, uh, get started. So how to reach those who don't want to be reached, um, designing successful outreach training. Thanks for coming and spending some time with us today. I was going over the emails uh, that some people had sent responses to me from my email from yesterday, and I noticed that a lot of people are talking about things along the lines of, you know, I, I, I give training, um, sometimes it's a target audience, which works great. And sometimes it's um, a general audience, and I'm not getting people attending. And, and another thing that kind of came up was when they do come, how do I make sure that they stay engaged? How do I keep them going because they don't really have to be here? And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Those are the main points that we're going to be hitting. In order to get started, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, initially about what outreach training is. So the way that I tend to think about it is there's training I have to take. Right? It can be compliance policies, internet security policies, ethics policies, this kind of stuff. A lot of it's internal training, you know, and then there's that you kind of have to do it in order to stay current with your job, and it's a requirement. Another thing might be if I'm training on some equipment, I, I need to take some safety training, or if I'm using a computer program, you know, in order to get that. So this is stuff you have to take, that you've got to do. And then there's the stuff that you really don't have to take. Um, a lot of organizations use outreach, outreach activities uh, to bring services and information to those who aren't kind of in their, um, who aren't, don't, don't, don't come to their buildings. Um, a lot like uh, art museums will put on art classes or uh, university departments will take, do a chemistry roadshow to bring this out to the public. And this is the kind of training, the training you don't have to take training that organizations have to persuade you it's worth your while to take. That's the kind of training that we'll be talking about today. And there's a lot of different formats for that. Um, Disasterity.org put together a really quick, this is a couple of weeks ago, came out when everybody was worried about Ebola, uh, a really quick uh, e-learning section on Ebola awareness, pulling from public sources like the CDC. Nobody's going to force anybody to take this training, but they made it out there, they put it available, uh, and they're encouraging people to kind of take it. Another form of e-learning outreach that you might find is sometimes private companies like Rackspace, uh, they sell software solutions, and they want people to take their training to order, in order to understand how to use the software solutions. You don't have to take it but they make it available because it makes it more effective. So they've got to persuade people to come. And these are e-learning examples. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. I tend to do a lot of e-learning. But you know, at the same time, we have things like today's webinar where you want to reach a larger audience. Face-to-face -face training is often you know, kind of the old standby and, and still used very much for outreach training. And mobile is the new frontier. Um, it's really kind of exciting to think that with these phones, with these devices, we can we can bring training to anybody anywhere where they need this. And let's go ahead and actually take our first poll. So I'm going to open up the poll. So this poll is in progress. So if you could just kind of give me a quick response. How often do you reach out to, to, to learners outside your organization? Is it something that you do very common? And I'm seeing a lot of results coming in. Good, got about 41, 50% voted. It's kind of looking like it's going between um, you do it all the time and a lot of you hope to do it in the future. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry about the 15% of you who, who are wondering about life outside of the office, but I, I kind of know how you feel. So that's so we have a pretty good sense of that. That's kind of what I want to talk about here today. I want to talk about ways, if you're going to get involved in doing this, so what are some techniques that you can use? And if you've been doing this all the time, maybe some helpful hints that might help you along. Okay, so how do we bring people to training? There's a couple of key things to think about here. Um, basically, I can summarize it by making it appealing and making it easy. So making the training appealing, make it pretty. Visually, intellectually engaging, emotionally engaging. When I've finished taking this training, I need to feel that that was an hour, a day, a week that was well spent of my time. I didn't have to take it, but I am in so much a better position since I spent the time doing it. Easy. Not in the sense of it's easy to pass, right? Because if we've got a quiz that's easy to pass, I don't need to take any training in order to, um, if I don't need to take any training in order to pass the quiz, then what's the point of the training? When I say easy, I mean easy to take. So 
I've worked for several organizations, and, and one organization had this, it was a complicated system to register. So you had about five to seven screens that you had to go through, inputting your personal information, your work information, your address, your payment screen, in order to register for a class. And then you would get an email. And that email would pop up, so you go over to your, to your email system, and you would find a link in that email that would link you to a different system where you could create a username and a password that you could then use to enter the LMS, which you can then navigate to find the training. Now, this, there's a lot of reasons for that level of complexity, and I'm, we all deal with things like legacy systems, and, and building systems on top of each other lends towards this. And I'm not knocking the IT folks at all, because I think they did a great job with the tools that they had. But at the same time, that's a lot of barriers. That's a lot of effort um, in order to register for a class, especially for one that we don't have to take. So I encourage you to think about those things not as necessarily um, as, as, as stuff that has to be, but rather barriers that can be lowered to make it easy to take the training. And we're going to talk about this as we kind of go through this. We can't probably get rid of all those barriers, but if we can pay attention to them and try to lower them, we're going to be much more likely to bring people into our training. So let's go ahead and get started uh, by talking about um, how to get an audience to sign up for your course. Now, I can't promise you these are surefire methods, but these are things that I'd like to encourage you to, to think about. So one of the core things is framing that course to your audience. And think about that in terms of course titles. I think about it in terms of course descriptions. There's not a lot of research done on course titles, like how to make engaging toward course titles. But if I'm making a course title from an instructional design standpoint, if it's an introduction to photography class, introduction to photography, photography 101. But if I take a little sideways look at it and realize there's not a lot of research done about course titles, but there is a lot of research done about getting headlines and getting people to click through on blog posts and blog articles, that's, you can start to see some possibilities there. Because if I get a Twitter, uh, if I get a tweet, I've got to frame that tweet in such a way that I'm going to want to click on that link so I can get that click through. And what we find is there's a lot of places to talk, that, that talk about this sort of thing. So for example, instead of Photography 101, I might go with something like, you know, three things to do with your iPhone at a concert, two of which are probably illegal. And I'm not saying that we have to go all upworthy and, and BuzzFeed listicles, but I think by taking a more engaging approach to the ways that we design our course titles, we're going to bring people in. And that goes to descriptions as well. Because as an instructional designer, I think the most logical, straightforward course description is the list of the learning objectives. Because, I mean, what does a user need to know, right? They, they need to know what they're going to be able to do after they get out of the course. But from a marketing perspective, that might not be quite as effective. But one thing to remember, of course, is that who, is, who are you talking to? Right? Maybe you're talking to that, that audience down there, but maybe you're talking to the manager. Maybe the manager has figured out, you know, I want my people to sign up to this. So you have to frame it to talk to the audience who's going to be signing people up for this course. And in order to get started, a, a fantastic tool that we've started to use that, that, that's actually kind of neat is A-B testing. Uh, can you all give me a show of hands? How many of you all have, have heard about A-B testing? I'm seeing no hands raised. Okay, so A-B testing is a marketing technique, um, and it's a computer testing technique. So the basic idea is I take, I take on a random selected section of my audience, I show them two different things, and I see which one gets the most click-throughs. So like for one page, and this is kind of interesting, kind of effective, there was a study done in Psychology Today that had web page exactly the same. The only difference was that the click to register button was red on one page and the click to register button was green on the other page. And it turns out that the red version saw 34% more people clicking through to sign up. Now there's other things going on there. The red version also saw that there was less activity. People lingered on the web page less. So that might indicate that these are people who make decisions quickly and so they just drove more of an impulse sign up. Whereas the green button people spent the time looking at it and said, you know, maybe that's not really for me. But the idea is to put it out there, and we've, we've done this. I want to share this with you. Y'all, some of you may have, may have seen this. We, the, on our last webinar, which was e-learning that works without breaking the bank, we actually did A-B testing. We took a one 
Cut the Crap, How to Create E-Learning That Works, kind of an edgy title. And we sent that out to a random selection of our audience. And then we took our more grown up, you know, sophisticated title, E-Learning That Works Without Breaking the Bank. And we sent that one out to uh, another random selection of our audience. And then we waited and we saw what the registration rates were. Well, it turns out that the registration rates were actually pretty much the same. But we actually did go with the title, E-Learning That Works Without Breaking the Bank, because of this guy. Some people, it seems, thought that using the word crap in an e-learning pre presentation was a little bit too edgy for them. So got some complaints about that, so we went with a more state title. So appealing and easy. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about registering, for courses, some ways to bring people in. How do you make it engaging once they're there? Face-to-face -face is the standby, and face-to-face -face we see a lot of uh, courses still being done this way. It's kind of the standard. It's where our training started, and so a lot of what goes on in face-to-face -face has difficulties or encounters troubles when it tries to jump into other mediums. So we still see occasionally this kind of face-to-face -face training where everybody's sitting down in a lecture. Now, <laughs> you might be arranged in tables, but you still got a presenter up there who is sharing her knowledge with all the learners. And that can function well in you know, education, maybe a university setting. But when you get to adult learners who kind of know the material and aren't just passive receptacles of knowledge, as we know, this becomes problematic. And so the best trainers actually make things engaging. Now, I've not been on a training that's made use of a rock wall, uh, but if it did, I'd be sure to go back. But a lot of times what instructors will do is they will engage with their audience. Uh, they'll read the class, they'll figure out the knowledge level, they'll get people talking, sharing their information, getting people to learn from each other so the best instructors in this situation really are less of an instructor and more of a facilitator. And that's really effective in a classroom training. But what happens when you take that and you try to make it into something like a webinar, like we're on today? You've got a lot of things going on in a webinar. There's some real advantages. You can have a webinar with a 15-person with a class, but the real advantage is when you can reach out to dozens, you know, reach out to, to hundreds of people with a webinar. You still have that instructor who can interact to the audience, but it's less direct. You kind of have to use various mediums to, to connect. Another advantage of a webinar, of course, is that instructor, uh, students have to travel to face-to-face -face classes. That takes time out of their day. With webinars, they can be right there in, um, in front of you. And, uh, and as long as you've got a computer and an internet connection, you're good. So let's take a quick hand raise. And let's see, how many of you have given webinars yourself? Oh, fantastic, a good number. Oh, a great number. Hey, could y'all take a few minutes and in the chat pane, uh, send out to the entire audience the, those things that you've found that make an effective webinar. What, what, what's, what are the successful techniques that you've used when you're doing your webinar? So we'll give people a few minutes, if you wouldn't mind putting some in, sharing with the audience, uh, some things in the chat pane. Okay, well that's all right. So let's go ahead and it looks like the chat feature is not, not functioning that well right now. So we'll just go ahead and move on. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that y'all have. So if, if we want to, if y'all at any time want to sort of pop in some stuff while we're talking about webinars, about the sort of things that you found as successful, that would be, I'd really appreciate that. So what I'd like to talk about, oh, here we go. Okay, so it's, we've got some stuff coming in. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so asking for feedback is good. Fantastic visuals, yeah, visuals are very important because people are, of course, looking at this on the screen. Well-known speakers, absolutely bring stuff in. So thanks very much for bringing that in. So one of the things I like to start with is talking a little bit about the formats of webinars and things you can do. Probably pre-recorded webinars, not that common, but they're out there. They can be kind of ha handy for, it can kind of end up being sort of like a quick video, but it is a way to allow an instructor to make a connection with an audience if, for example, it serves as an introduction to some other form of training. Another thing like what we're kind of seeing today is where I'm giving a lot of information, and, and but I'm asking for feedback and I'm asking for questions, and we've got some questions that are coming in at the end. Practical, instant, practical interesting content is another thing that just kind of came through the chat pane. And then another format is intensive chat sessions, which I'll talk about in more detail a little bit detail a little bit later, but the neat thing about intensive chat sessions is it really allows people to share their thoughts um, and share their knowledge. 
Okay, so how do we go about making webinars easy? Well, the beauty about webinars are the is the technology. These are the three big ones uh, that I've seen in use. Um, there's a lot of them out there. WebEx is kind of neat because it has a, a trick that if you're working in a computer system that's locked down by your IT department, you can actually kind of run it inside your browser where you can go to webinar right now. And a lot of people like Adobe Connect. Uh, so these are very wonderful tools that allow you to make those connections. Um, you've got chats and a lot of them, questions, polls, all these sorts of things that you can use to interact with your audience. And which is great when it works. Of course, when it doesn't, we end up here. right? So maybe the presenter neglects to unmute himself at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, maybe your audio is not working. Maybe there is uh, the audio is dropping as you're going through it. This happened to a webinar that I was on uh, about a week ago it had been set to allow to notify everybody when somebody enters into the webinar, which is great if everybody comes in and stays, but when connections get dropped and you come in again, it was kind of disruptive. So there's all these technological issues. So how do you deal with this? Well, you plan for it, you practice it, you, you, you figure out what works and what doesn't, but really essentially, I think uh, our experience, you just have to plan, you just have to allow for it. So you notice at the beginning of our presentation today, we took a couple of minutes uh, at the beginning, outlined the tools, and Brandy kind of helped us understand what to do if something goes wrong. We opened up the chat pane where you could send her questions if your audio wasn't working. So that means that instead of spending you know, 15 minutes giving a presentation, I get to spend 45 minutes giving a presentation. But I plan for that, and I allow for that. And the other really big thing you can do is you can have somebody like Brandy. Brandy's a fantastic facilitator, and she's allowing me to focus on my uh, presentation. And it worked really great because with the chat feature, it ended up going to Brandy, so she was able to kick those back to me so I can see what those, what those things are, and it helps the presentation move. So the two things that I think can really help make a webinar easy is one, accepting that there's going to be problems with it, and allowing time for that at the beginning, and also having a great facilitator. How do we make it appealing? Well, webinars are great, but there is the problem of attention and people uh, paying attention. So right now I've got 48% versus 52%. I don't know how go to webinar determines attentiveness, but and that makes sense, right? Because you're in front of your computer, you've got a lot of stuff going on. You might be zapping back in to pay attention when something interesting comes up. I am obsessive about not checking my phone during meetings. I, 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 I mute it. I don't look at it unless you know. I know there might be an emergency coming along. But you put me in a webinar, and I got like six things going on my second screen, and this can be problematic. Basically, you know, people get new thoughts about every seven seconds ago, and each of those new thoughts demands a little bit of an attention. So, how do you remain engaging? You know. As I've, you know, we've discovered for a while, there's a lot of talk, talk about uh, you know, multitasking and, and, and how to multitask effectively. And eventually, we kind of reached the conclusion, a lot of research demonstrated that nobody really multitasks effectively. Well, there might be some brilliant people out there who do. But what most of us do when we multitask is we switch attention very rapidly. And every time we switch attention, it takes a few seconds to gain reorientation. That means that it's more difficult to keep people engaged in an ongoing presentation like this, engaged, appealing. So how do we do that? Well, we, do, we can do some of the things that we've already done today with this webinars. We can use the hand feature, which is surprising, uh, can be surprisingly effective. You might have been on a present, uh, presentation I did uh, a few weeks ago, and in that one, I wanted to demonstrate uh, how to use multiple choice questions as a way to create branch scenarios. And so in order to demonstrate that, I asked people to raise their hand as to which option we should go with. And it proved very effective. I got a lot of people raising their hands to kind of go through this system. And uh, it, was, it was really kind of neat. And of course, polls that uh, we've been doing those a little bit today. People enjoy sharing their thoughts. Of course, the thing about a poll is it's not enough just to say, OK, everybody likes donuts. We've got to take that and we've got to feed that back into the audience um, and make sure that, uh, that while we're talking, you know, we're altering our presentations to engage the audience as we're going through. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of formats was this intensive chat session. Now, you'll notice that on the lower left-hand corner, I've got a, um, 
section that uh, that 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 uh, link will take you to uh, the place where I pulled this image and a nice little discussion about how to use chat sessions. And the link on the right takes you to a, a blog by Kathy Moore where she talks about tips that she uses webinars. Her preferred webinar is actually this kind of intensive chat session because she can get people talking in various areas. And as they're talking, they're sharing knowledge, they're becoming engaged. And she says, yeah, there's a problem when I've got a couple of hundred people in a webinar. I, I run into this difficulty where I, um, you know, I, I can't see everything fast enough. So she says, I just take some time out and I let everybody know I'll be catching up with the chat. Y'all go ahead and chat. Let me catch up. She scrolls through the chat and then she re-engages. So there's pluses and minuses with these techniques, but by using hands, by using polls, by using chats, you can create a, 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 a very engaging environment that, that helps mitigate that lack of the instructor audience feedback that you uh, that you have in a webinar uh, that you don't have when you're doing face-to-face -face training. So appealing, make sure it's engaging, easy, allow for the fact that you're going to have problems and figure out a way around that. Now, let's take a little bit time to talk about e-learning. A recent study by the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education on massive online open sorry, massive open online courses, or MOOCs, shows that participation drops off rapidly after the first couple of weeks. And only 4% of people actually manage to go through the whole thing. Now, that's a little bit different than the stuff that we may be doing. I mean, I, I generally don't design semester-long courses. Uh, my courses are, you know, a couple of hours, maybe four hours, something along those lines. But it does point to the fact that keeping people engaged in the e-learning environment is difficult. There's no instructor there to get any feedback. There's no way for the audience to give feedback. And it's very limited in a lot of formats of e-learning for the audience to actually take control of their own learning, as you might do in an instructor-led environment. Without an instructor, you've got to create situations where learners can be self-directed self in order to maintain their appeal. So let's take our second poll. And our second poll is going to be about e-learning. So if I can ask you, uh, I'm going to launch this poll. How often you use e-learning in your organization? So the poll's open, and it's in progress. So if y'all could take a few moments and just let us know where where we stand. So most of your courses are online. Some of you, okay, that's pretty. That's good. Okay, and I've been to a lot of organizations where their primary focus is uh, instructor-led, and that they're hoping to bring in online training. And that's kind of an interesting environment to be in. <laughs> And some of you are operating in a rather primitive uh, environment, and that's pretty neat. I I'm glad to see that some of you have a pretty even balance uh, between online and um, instructor-led. So hopefully this will be useful to you. So for those of you who are doing most of your courses online, the, and for those of you who aren't, who have not really engaged in e-learning yet, let's talk about some, and 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 for those the, those hopeful few who are out there just hoping to upgrade to technology. Um, let's spend some time talking about, for those of you working with e-learning or just getting into e-learning, some techniques that we might use with e-learning. Okay, so with e-learning, to make e-learning appealing and easy, let's start off again by talking about some formats. Generally, a lot of e-learning is click next with quizzes. Ethan uh, Edwards calls this, uh, click next, I click next, I click next, then I take a test. Um, there's not a lot of engagement with the um, audience. Uh, there's not a lot of learner engagement. The learner is basically consuming knowledge and then taking the test. Then there's what I tend to do in a lot of the training that I develop, and that's click next with interactions. There's still navigation, and maybe it doesn't actually need to be a formal next button, but it's a pretty clear navigation. And uh, But there's interactions. There's ways to engage your audience and ways for them to put the training to use built into your platform. And then there's totally immersive, where you design a custom e-learning environment. And I've seen some fantastic stuff with hazmat training or uh, you know, actually designing a, a truck that you drive, that you turn the radio on and off, that you use the mouse to, to drive the, uh, turn the steering wheel, uh, press the brake pedals, really immersive stuff. That tends to be pretty fantastically engaging, but also kind of expensive, uh, both in time and money. So, and the other thing I want to mention is for those of you who are familiar with, with e-learning, you'll recognize uh, level one, the level two, level three, pretty industry standard lingo with using e-learning. So level one is click next with quizzes, level two, click next with interaction, level three, totally immersive. We have an idea of the formats. Let's figure out how to make e-learning effective. 
Okay, so I'm going to do this in a couple of ways. Effective, appealing, engaging. Because to appeal to an audience that's to, that just setting through, we need to figure out a way to bring them in. We need to engage them. And a language I'd like to do to talk about this with is uh, Tom Coleman, uh, in his rapid e-learning blog a couple of weeks ago, had a really neat post on the two components of interactivity. He says what you have to do is you have to interact with the screen and interact with the brain. Well, this is a module from a course that we developed on helping caregivers tr talk with children and young adults about how to set goals. And the part of this was, let's set, let's figure out how to set, how to achieve long-term goals. So we have the, the interact with the screen, okay, by, we click and we drag things into boxes. But then we have also in this interaction, the interact with the brain. Because in order to achieve a long-term goal, our older youth, she wants to achieve a long-term goal, she realizes that what she needs to do is she needs to mow more lawns in order to bring in more money so that she can afford her phone. And in fact, we see that here for the young child, the long-term goal is to have it by the bicycle. The short-term goal, start with training wheels. Long-term goal for the elementary school child is to help mom prepare a dinner. Well, let's start by baking cookies, one part of it. And then we've already talked about the older youth. So this is a way to engage people. See, bear in mind when we're designing e-learning to uh, think about not just, as Cami Bean calls it, clickety-click, bling, bling, you know, just stuff that looks pretty and that you get to move around on the screen. But make sure that those interactions are in furtherance of your learning objectives. I want to give a special call out to branch scenarios. I think branch scenarios They've been around for a while. This is a, one of a more recent um, development. It's a, it's a website program, branchtrack.com, that allows you to, uh, to design these. Um, if any of you did choose your own adventure, it's something similar. The idea behind a branch scenario is I get to go through and I get to make selections. And as I make a selection, I see the responses in the selection. What comes back to me, what happens after I make a selection can determine my path that I go down. So I can come down a bad path, I can come down a good path, I can come down a great path. The beauty about it is that if I come down that bad path, I can go back in and I can try to make those decisions again to try to reach that best solution. It engages the learner. It's as close as we're going to get to self-directed learning, I think, in e-learning uh, without going to a full-fledged game. It's not difficult to design, but it's elegant. It's elegant. You're able to abstract the instructor. You're able to let the learner teach themselves as you're going through it. So a couple of, 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 of little interactions, right? I've got, my, I've got my branch scenarios. I've got my um, uh, click and drags. Where do you get ideas? All over the place. It's, there's a lot of stuff out there. This is a selection uh, I pulled from uh, another Kathy Moore site that just talk about, talks about various kinds of samples of doing e-learning. So in the upper right, you've got lithography, which is great because in another life, I actually taught the history of communication. But I never really, I never really got a full understanding grasp of how lithography works until I went through this interaction. And it's a great little thing. It's from uh, Museum of Art. Kern Me is a little tool that allows you to kern things uh, by clicking and dragging and setting up and you submit. Blood type game, the wealthiest Americans ever. I love this. This is from the New York Times. And what it does, just the graphic way. So by the way that they designed the lifespan at the bottom, we can see that most of the wealthiest Americans actually tended to live around the latter part of the 19th century. We can also see by the way that they enclose the numbers uh, and wealth in a circle, the relative wealth of what those numbers actually mean. So we can see the vast difference between 31 million and 192 million. And then of course they've got images and they've got more detail as you, as you go over it. Interactions don't have to be complex in order to be effective. They can be well designed. The next, the last one that I want to talk about here, spent as an example. This is kind of a heartbreaking uh, story. It's kind of a branched interaction, very complex one, branch scenario, where the premise is you've lost your job, you've lost your house, you've got to get a minimum wage job, and you've got to make it to the end of your end of the month. Can you do that? At this particular course, the path that I chose when I was doing the sample was um, as a waitress or a waiter. And, you know, there's this option. 
I can take a course in computer science. I could get a higher paycheck. Cost two hundred dollars. My payday is not till the tenth, and I only have three hundred forty-two dollars left in my account, and I haven't bought groceries yet. It's it's a really tough thing to kind of go through, but you can see how that can be an effective way to give to help people understand and connect on an emotional level, because so much of this training is on an emotional level, on an emotional level, and what it means to be poor. So, appealing. How to make things appealing. I'm not suggesting that we need to go and come up with something this complex, but I do like this idea of going and looking at these kinds of things and saying, how can that work for my training? I took the wealthiest Americans ever. I basically took the idea of a sliding interaction and the entry relationships, and I adapted that for an internet uh, security course that I'm working on. So being aware of the possibilities, I think, is like 80% of the way of getting to designing effective, appealing e-learning. So we talked about effective, how do we make it easy? Now, I want to read you something from Ross Float. It kind of came out here a little while ago, uh, and Ross Float is the head of Float Design Partners. They do apps, websites, that kind of stuff. He says, next time you're working on a long-term project, appoint a designated white hat jerk. I love that phrase, white hat jerk. Someone whose job it is to keep thinking about how a person or group with a bit of time on their hands might try to bend and twist your system for a few laps. Not asking to be a devil's advocate, but someone always thinking, how could someone fool around with this, and what would that mean for our end product? So white hat jerk. How do I make this easy? One of the key things, I think, is making sure that no matter what users have done, you have prepared for it, and you have explored it, and you've expected it. For example, one of our standard tests is we think, OK, so somebody's sitting there listening to a slide of e-learning. What happens if they click next? before that, that, that screen finishes. It's surprising how many times when you go to the next screen, the audio from the first screen is still going on while the audio from the second screen starts playing. Easy to go in and fix, but you've got to do that. What happens if you go backwards? Another thing that we had that uh, was kind of fun was we were working on a course on, on, on teaching people some math basics, trigonometry and some other stuff in order for a professional uh, job that they had to do. Well, we kept getting you know, people would type in the calculations in our testing, they type in the calculations, and the answer would come out wrong, even though the answer was right. Well, we looked into it, what we found out was that we had asked them to answer this in two decimal places. Well, that made a lot of sense, it was the appropriate, you know, response, but what we had neglected to, to figure out is that if they rounded to two decimal places through the series of calculations, they can come up with one answer. If they went through with their calculator and only rounded at the end, the answer was a little bit different. Different enough so that it came up as incorrect. And of course we had some people who decided not to round at all because people just don't read directions. Well, so we had to go back into that system and we had to arrange things a little bit so that we gave them a range, legitimate range to work through. White hat jerk. Figuring out how to break your course so you can break it before your users do. A friend of mine uh, calls this, you changing from a making a mentality to a breaking mentality. You have to change from being a maker to being a breaker, because we're all concerned with getting that design perfect when we're in there. But when it comes time to test it, we've got to do our best to destroy it so that we can find those things and fix them. Now, are we going to find everything? Probably not. But everything that you can find is one less impediment to your user. Nothing can be more frustrating than getting to the quiz section of a course and entering in the right answer and having it come up wrong every time. There's no instructor to ask for a clearance or, or, or what, what went wrong. You have to design for that. So you make it appealing by making it engaging, by designing your interactions effectively, by appealing to emotions. You make it easy by having somebody be a white hat jerk, by removing the barriers from your e-learning. Now the last area that we're going to spend some time talking about is mobile. Okay, and so for mobile, I'm, we're going to go ahead and start our last poll. And what I'd like for us to do is if y'all could take a few moments and um, respond and let me know how y'all are using mobile in your organization. Because I've worked with a lot of organizations that uh, are just getting into mobile, and that's kind of an exciting place to be. And some organizations that have been pretty well developed in mobile. Everybody's saying that mobile is almost here. Mobile is almost here. In a lot of places, it is almost here. In some places, it is. Train training is here. People do training on their phones even when we don't want them to. Don't expect them to. Okay, so we have we have some people who use it every day. Um, it looks like the majority of people are are kind of kicking around ideas or or you know mobile's not really on the horizon. 
Well, let's spend a little bit of time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what mobile does, and I think think this will help those where it's a couple of ideas that we're kicking around. Maybe it's not on your horizon. Uh, those who use to train every day. Hopefully, there'll be a couple of things here that you can take away. So, the first question that I think we really need to ask is, what does mobile mean? For example, one option is to use uh, responsive design. So, responsive design is basically having your having your website designed so that as it's viewed on a smaller screen, things get rearranged. So you might have a menu out that's on a horizontal bar on a desktop screen, but when it comes down to a mobile screen, it's wrapped up into a drop-down menu. And you all might have seen this on just some regular websites you're visiting. Sometimes there might be an image that illustrates that's posted on the right, but when it's put onto the mobile, now it moves to the top. And that might be the appropriate approach for your organization. If you really are looking at you know, training that, that is going to be effective um, in a variety of environments. On the other hand, uh, maybe an EPUB might be the training that you need, right? Because you can design an EPUB really quickly with today's tools. Now, you do need a, a browser of some kind, a Kindle or a Nook, or um, I tend to use Marvin to access the EPUB, but if you're designing a training aid, maybe just having that kind of format is what you need. Of course, video. Video is perhaps the most responsive of designs and maybe one of the most effective ways to actually leverage mobile. We tend to think of video maybe on a big computer screen, 24-inch computer screen, but it also works effectively on a phone. It resizes itself automatically. I was uh, attended a conference a couple years ago and there was a company from Houston, an oil company, that was having a difficult getting training done on their oil rigs because the bandwidth was zilch. Couldn't get anything out there. They did have the option of training people and then sending them to the rig. They didn't want to train somebody for a week and then send them out to the rig six weeks later and have to have them remember what's going on. So their solution, issue everybody iPhones, company iPhones, preloaded with training videos. Brought them up on their phone. When they're standing in front of the machine, they ran the training video. They saw exactly what they needed to do. They said it was really, really effective training. They did a, did a great job in doing what they needed to do. So maybe mobile is something you want to think about. You might want to design a special app. And in fact, we're going to talk a little bit more along those lines as we go on. Advantages are there's a marketing advantage because somebody doesn't need to open up a Kindle to see it, right? Maybe you want to have branding. Also, while responsive is getting better, there's a lot of stuff in a phone, like a, a, a GPS component, located, like locator services that you might be able to use in special designed training, an app for your training that might not be available in these other formats. And then, of course, you can design. I put Captivate 8 because Lectora and Articulate, the other two big players in the field, have some mobile-ish, but Captivate 8 in their latest version is actually taking it to trying to make their uh, training that's developed on these devices responsive. But there, is a pro there are problems with that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you can design e-learning for the phone. And uh, if you do that, you might want to think about how your LMS is going to work on a phone as well. Okay, so one of the big questions as we're going through and thinking about mobile is do you want to do Android or do you want to do iOS? A lot of people say, well, let's do both, which would be great. Sometimes you don't have the resources to do that. A lot of people look at Android and say Android has a larger market share. However, when you look at how people use their phones, people tend to use iOS more than they do um, Android to access the web. So that might be more effective to target iOS. Another thing, I, I know I know we're educators here, I know we're trainers here, we don't, our minds are not in the gutter, but it's useful to point out that another factor in your decision might be that people tend to, developers who design for iOS actually tend to make more money. And the, the general accepted reason is that uh, an, an Apple device is expensive. And if I'm going to spend 600 bucks for an iPhone, I'm not going to worry about spending two or three or four bucks for an app. But if I'm buying an Android device because they're cheaper, then I'm probably going to tend toward more web uh, ad-supported or free apps. Something else to consider. All right, so those are fact large-scale factors. What is your approach going to be? What best suits the needs of your organization? And what device should I deliver it on? Now let's talk a little bit about how to make this training appealing. There's a lot to be considered here. I'm just going to hit two, two pretty broad points here. Context. So when I was looking for an image to illustrate this, I, I, I came across, this is a, this is a public bus on, um, in Chicago, and I thought, you know, 
Look, and there's got to be somebody there who's using their phone, and sure enough. This is the thing. This is how people use their phones, right? She might take a quick look at it while she's on this bus stop and then and maybe look at it more later while she's waiting for a bus. Maybe somebody's in a doctor's office and they're looking at their phone. Maybe they are in line at a supermarket. The way we use our phones is to consume information in short bursts. Oh, I think we need to bear that in mind because if we're designing training to consume information or designing a 60-minute e-learning training, People will still complete that 60 minute if it's delivered by mobile, but the way they'll do it is they'll do it in 23 minute segments. And kind of the question is, is that really the most effective way to design that? So bearing in mind the context, I think helps make our training appealing. Another thing is, I always wanted one of these. Now, when these came out, and I'm probably dating myself here, my fingers were actually small enough to actually press those buttons. Let's face it, fingers are fat and buttons are small. So when we're designing, we need to think about the interface when we're thinking about making this appealing. Part of the problem with designing you know, responsive training that's going to be effective on a screen and also effective on a tablet or on a phone is the device size shrinks. And so that button that's easily clickable on your screen can be maddening to touch when it's on your phone. But never fear, both Apple and Android put out a couple of things that talk about how to design for this environment. And there are a ton of guides out there. So, you know, as always, there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. People have been designing apps for several years now. Let's reach out. Let's take advantage of the knowledge. The key thing here is that we go all the way back to face-to-face -to -face training, webinars, e-learning, that when we're designing for a phone, we need to design for a phone. And now let's talk a little bit about making it easy. It's the same kind of idea. Now, what I'm bringing up these two graphics here because I want to think about, I want my training to be effective. I want to make use of the latest uh, techniques. I want to make sure that it doesn't crash. And that becomes kind of difficult uh, when we consider mobile devices when you're designing an app. So we're kind of talking more about apps in this set uh, right now. But iOS, uh, this is actually up a little bit. As you all may know, they had a trouble, a uh, lot of glitches rolling out with uh, the last version of their operating system. But you'll notice that even on iOS devices, the last two operating systems are the majority. And uh, Lollipop is the latest version. It doesn't show up in this graphic because these stats are just from uh, earlier this week and it hasn't been brought in. So Still, a lot of devices uh, are still running. KitKat is the second most recent version, but if you want to hit the majority of your market, you're aiming for Jelly Bean. And this uh, becomes a bit prob problematic. And there's a re the reasons for this, of course, is that, uh, is that Apple uh, designs devices, and then they design so the two of them together. They, 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 they function seamlessly. So uh, after a little while, if you've got space on your device, after you'll have a little pop-up that says, hey, update to the latest version. Some Android devices do that, but a lot of times when somebody manufactures an Android phone, they find Android as a free operating system, they install it on the phone, but they don't create an, an upgrade capability. So when we're trying to make our, our training effective and uh, easy to take, where it doesn't crash, lowering those barriers, bear in mind how you're designing your app, if indeed you're designing an app. Okay, so we're reaching the end of our time here. I want to allow a couple of things for questions. Let's, let's summarize this. We want to make it appealing. We want to make it easy. We want to make, we want to think about when we're starting, we want to think about marketing. Take off the trainer hat, put on the marketer hat, do A-B testing, do other research, see what your users are looking for. And that's because that's what's going to bring them in to your course. And then once they're there, figure, let's, 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 let's think about how to keep it easy and appealing so that uh, they'll stay. So lower those barriers, and when you can't lower barriers like with a webinar, and we've seen plenty of glitches today in this webinar, yet we worked through them. Brandy's been a tremendous help. Y'all know that if there's something that goes wrong, you can go up to the questions pane. That's kind of part of, of what's going on, I think, with this. Uh, and making webinars easy, making e-learning, mobile learning easy, removing those barriers, and make it appealing. Consider your context. Mobile, e-learning, webinars. Make it engaging uh, in, in terms of interactivity, whether you're in a webinar or on e-learning or on a mobile device. All of this drives engagement. The more engaged your learners are, the more it's the likely they are to be to come back for more. Thank you very much for taking your time here today and um, listening and participating in the webinar. And I do want to ask if there are any questions. Brandy, if you can maybe shoot me any questions that we might have.
Sure, we do have a couple questions, and everyone else, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the questions pane. We'll try to get to all of them. One question I received was, do you think it is effective to have a lot of attractive slides to keep people's attention? Yes, I think slide design actually is is really key. I've and there's a lot of resources out there. In fact, I can send some along. Um, with with slide design, it's kind of neat to also think not just about e-learning design, but also about how to design effective PowerPoint slides. So there's a lot of stuff about creating effective presentations, and that's kind of what we're doing here. Robin Williams has a great book where she just talked, it's called The Non-Designer's Design Book, and she just basically outlines some simple principles that you can use. Um, a, you know, keeping an eye on color scheme is also important. The goal is to make it, uh, part of making I think it appealing is to make it aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, and slides that aren't necessarily designed to be attractive, people can kind of look at that and kind of go, you know, it's just a, that another one of those barriers that we can remove by making sure that our appeal, uh, that our slide designs are visually attractive. Do we have any, any more questions, Randy? We do. I have a question on where do you find your best graphics? That's a good question. You know, so I can send out a couple of links. Uh, generally speaking, one of the things that we always try to pay a lot of attention to is uh, rights, commercial rights, and not to use images without permission. So um, a very effective place are stock image photography. The problem with stock image photography, there's a couple of them. One is they're getting to be pretty darn expensive. Uh, two is that uh, everybody seems to be very, very happy in stock images, uh, and, and that's not always the image that you're trying to convey. And another thing to think about is uh, PowerPoint has some pretty easy to use images to create, um, that you can create simple graphics with. So on the, uh, when I was talking about A-B testing and I had my little infographic then, I just created those in PowerPoint using some shapes and then saved them as a picture and then imported them back in. It would be a pretty effective tool to use. And so if you're looking for simple, not unattractive shapes. And that's another alternative you might think of. Good, and I will send out. I will send out a couple of links that I found pretty useful for that. Uh, do we have anything else, Brandy? Excellent. We do. We have another really good question. So I have a question about accessibility. This person said we currently have a click next quiz model, but we'd like to incorporate more interaction. But accessibility has been a major roadblock. So what what ideas do you have for accessibility? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, one of the things that we've done um, is consider the overall environment. So with a branch scenario, for example, that form of interaction can be done by, by clicking and dragging and some other stuff, but can also be done as a series of multiple choice questions. You're presented with this situation, what do you want to do? And then you can kind of use your multiple choice question in a different format. And so one way is to think about the different kinds of interactions that you might do and what are the ways to navigate through it. In another format, and it's not necessarily the best approach, but it is something to bear in mind, is the branching path. So sometimes what we've done is when there is an interaction that for whatever reason we deem is really important that the best way that this information is going to be worked with in talk, terms of talking with the learner is um, is a more complex one, is we have a branching path. So the second screen of the uh, module will be something along the lines of, uh, you know, do you, would you like to take a path that's designed for uh, people with mobility impairments or people with visual impairments or people with hearing impairments? And when they click on that link, it takes them down to a path so that it takes them down a path that's imminently readable by a screen reader. And a lot of stuff, um, you know, I might have a, I might have a, uh, an interaction that uses um, like a tabbed interaction, and I want my users to go through that tabbed interaction. Well, effectively, when a screen reader hits it, the screen reader is going to read that material sequentially anyway. So I can leave my tabbed interaction up for people who don't need the screen reader, branch off to a slide that has all that information just directly on the screen, and then bring them back together after that interaction is done. Uh, you have to maintain two different interactions. But effectively, um, the training is going to be the same uh, for the screen reader, use, person who's using a screen reader, whether they take a complex path or whether they take um, a, a simple path. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Do we have other questions? Are we getting to a point where we need to uh, maybe answer some of those uh, with the, uh, uh, in the emails? Yes, I think that's for the best. One. We're right at 11 o'clock. 
All right. Well, I just want to thank everybody again. Uh, as Brandy said, any questions that came in that we didn't get to talk to, to about today, I'll write up an email, and Brandy will be sending that out. And I'll also send out a, a list of resources for making attractive PowerPoint presentations and uh, some links for uh, for pictures that you might find uh, pictures that you might find useful. Thanks again for your time, everybody, and thank you very much, Brandy, for uh, being such an effective uh, facilitator here. I really appreciate your help. Of course, glad to help. Thanks again, everyone. That concludes the presentation for today. Again, we really appreciate you being here and supporting the e-learning community, and we hope to continue having a series of e-learning webinars so we can keep you up to date on what's happening in the e-learning world.